Okay, guys. Good morning. Well, I guess it's almost good afternoon. Um, just to let you guys know, this is going to be a little bit more interactive. So as much uh, input that we can get, even from those in the live stream, I think we have some moderators in here that if you have a question, you know, they'll raise their hand to me and we can hopefully answer that. Uh, this session is really to be informative. And I want to let you guys know that, you know, what I do, and there's a whole lot of range, and it takes all kinds of people in order to build buildings like this. So a uh, raise of hands right now, and, and we can shout it out too if we want to. Who's interested in doing a career in the built environment? Just about everyone. Oh, well, no, we got a little bit, just a few people. What about the others? What are we thinking? What do you guys want to do? And you guys can shout it out, anyone. Management, okay. Scientists, awesome. What else? What was that? Criminology, okay guys, this is great. Uh, so what I'm gonna be focusing on are three major, I guess you could say categories. So we have architecture, engineering, and then construction. And so I'm gonna dive into those a little bit more so that we can get to look at what we got. One second as it's loading. So again, so we have architecture, engineering, construction. Underneath those three categories, how many options do y'all think there are? Just give a number, any number. Six? What was that? Four? Awesome. So guys, really, the options are limitless. Think about it as we do, and I apologize, it looks like it's loading right now, but think about it as we do um, a business. Who does it take to run a business? We have accounting, we have marketing, we have project managers, we have presidents and CEOs like Matt. And in each of these categories, we also have those types of people. And so, you know, even though it's going to be tailored to that specific field or group, we still take all kinds of people in order to get something built. Okay. In just a second, we'll get going on this. While we're trying to troubleshoot here, okay, so let's do some little more interactive. Um, what do you guys think is above the ceiling, and how is it put together? We have a roof, we have insulation, we have beams, what else? Supports, lights, so we have electrical, we have structural things up there, we have insulation, so that helps with our energy and our electrical demands. What about the air? The air system, it's up there as well, right? And if we look, we've got diffusers, there's speakers so you can hear me, there's technology, Wi-Fi, and infrastructure. So think of all these components. What's below us? Any ideas? Ground, concrete, foundations. What about more steel? We've got carpet here. In some instances, what am I standing on right now? This is a floor, right? a stage, and it's elevated. It takes even people specializing in these types of things to build it. And so I kind of want to show you guys a little bit along the way. We're going to be highlighting a couple of projects that I've done. So do we have any Harry Potter fans? OK, great. <laughs> so I've got a lot more photos to share of that Harry Potter ride. And a uh, running joke, I have never ridden that ride. I helped build it, but I have not ridden it yet. And then any, um, well, healthcare, anyone wanting to go into healthcare at all? Maybe a little scientist over here? Well, I'm going to show you some, uh, some uh, photos from a project that was just recently on uh, a large hospital as well. Let's see if I can. Is it going to go? OK, here we go. Let's get going. So again, we have architecture, engineering, construction, and I asked you guys how many more things underneath those categories are there, and it's really limitless. And I only have a handful that I'm gonna show you, uh, but before you can become any of these things, what do you have to do? You have to learn, you have to go to school. And so there's different career paths that you can take depending on what you want to do. 
So we have three major categories as well for that. So you have your bachelor's degree, and that's traditional undergraduate degree. You have a master's degree, and that's a graduate degree. And usually those range two to three years. And then beyond that, you have a PhD. And so that's when you get the nice little doctor in front of your name, and you're a specialist in something within your field. And to give you an example, I want to show you my career path, or my education path. I went. Uh, to the University of Florida from Mountain View High School. Does anyone know where Mountain View is? Great, yes, so I was a small town girl, Mountain View High School, and I ended up going to the University of Florida. There, that I did an undergraduate degree in the Bachelor of Design of Architecture, and so that's four years. And instead of going a different, a more traditional route to become a licensed architect, I chose to go into construction management. And so I started a Master's of Science in Construction Management, and that just means that I wrote a thesis along the way as well. And I actually started that while I was still an undergrad. So again, even though your other education seems more rigid, it's really flexible to what you want to do. And even my degree, I started earlier, and I tailored it to what I wanted to do. So I ultimately ended up going into the construction management field, but I still utilize my architecture degree every single day. And I'll show you examples of that. Okay. And I want to go also highlight that you know even though we have the bachelor's and the master's and PhD, this is very similar to your engineers as well, if you want to be a scientist. And so engineering is more of a professional degree program, and it is usually four or five years, depending on the school you go to, okay? So keep that in mind. And you can even go further. I've got friends that are masters in mechanical engineering. I've got friends that are doctors of mechanical engineering. So they went up and on to do their PhD as well. So let's look at architecture, for example. This is what I mean by we have so many different options underneath a field. So architects, you need a project lead, someone that's going to be a leader and organize everyone to make sure they're doing what they need to do. You have a project manager, so that's usually your main architect that's managing design, right? You have other designers and schematic designers that help with that project manager. Think about the interior designers as well, whole nother realm. They choose the material, the texture, the lighting, the colors that you see. The architect is mainly in charge of the space that they're building. Even draftsmen. So does anyone use Revit in their classrooms right now? In East, I've heard a few out there on the floor. OK. So even with architectural draftsmen, it takes someone to create and do the finer drawings and the designs and the details, right? And then we also have to adhere to government guidelines. So we have building code specialists. So even though you have architecture as this whole career kind of block, underneath that you have so many options. And if you're an architecture firm, don't you need marketing and you need a business manager? You need IT support. You need all these different people to come together and make this a reality. Let's look at engineering next. How many different types of engineers do you guys think there are? Ten or twenty? Great. What about you guys? Fourteen? Infinity? Sixty-two. Wow. Okay, so we've got some specific ones, and we've got infinity. And I'm here to tell you that the world is evolving, right? It's always changing. When I was in your shoes, we didn't have drones. It was something that, oh, we thought about it, but we didn't have drones. Do you think it took an engineer to create that? Right. So the engineering field, even though we're creating and discovering, that's always changing as well. And so I've got a handful of ones that really apply the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we kind of highlighted when we talked about what this room is constructed of. So we have structural engineers. Mechanical engineers, they deal with your HVAC system. Plumbing, how that water gets to you, how that water leaves the building, how that water sometimes integrates with your cooling system. We have civil engineers. Any idea of what a civil engineer might do? Nope, not exactly. Anyone else? You're thinking about it, yeah.
try to figure out the things for like buildings, something like that. I don't really know. Okay, well, that's great because I feel like no one kind of had an idea. So we kind of mentioned underneath this, there's foundations. Going through those foundations, there's also the infrastructure that serves this whole building. And so that includes your sanitary systems, your storm drainage. Civil engineers will be able to design your parking lot so it won't hold water and you're not stepping in puddles when you get out of your car, right? They connect to the city's sanitary and sewage systems. They control the grading, and grading meaning like moving dirt and earthwork. And they get to control that, and they look at the soil and determine what type of foundations you need in order for you to be successful in that type of soil. Civil engineers can also go into the effect of roadways and building, uh, building bridges and designing different turn radius of all of your overpasses and interstate systems. So that kind of gives you an idea of a civil engineer. Honestly, when I was in your shoes, I thought I was going to be a civil engineer. And then I got to college and I saw that architecture and I was like, oh man, well I don't know if I can design. That seems really challenging. I know I can do the math, but I don't know if I can design. And so I chose the architecture route. We also have chemical engineers, and so that's like your scientists, right? We have environmental engineers, the impact on wetlands and different uh, water systems and rivers and lakes. Do we have any questions on engineering so far? OK, let's go into construction. This is kind of where my field of expertise is. So we have superintendents. They're the ones in the field with the boots on, with the hard hat on, managing the schedule, managing the quality, managing all these different systems that go in together. Those are our superintendents. We have project managers. Project managers are more of the cost control, making sure that the equipment and these lights are going to show up on time, making sure that the HVAC units are going to show up on time. And these presentations and all the furniture. So that's kind of a project management role. They're in charge of contracts and cost control. And when something changes on the drawings, they see it, they price it, and they make sure it's going to get implemented, right? And it's all a teamwork, right? Subject matter experts. What do you guys think this might be? If you're a subject matter expert, build certain things in the building? OK. Anyone else? Let's say I have a very special roof system, and I am the subject matter expert on roofs, everything roofs. And so I'm that person that that project team can call, and I'll be able to give them information. I can come out to the job site. I can look and inspect that roof, make sure it's putting in correctly. I could be a subject matter expert on concrete. And I know you guys know, know yet, or maybe you do, but concrete comes in different mixes, different designs, different forms. You have to build a formwork, a temporary structure, in order for that concrete to be formed and filled and then cure over time. And so I could be a cool like, subject matter expert, just concrete itself, no ins and outs, how to test it. And that kind of leads me into inspectors as well. And so when we have inspectors, we have people that test materials to make sure it's going to withstand. If this carpet is spill-proof, don't you think it needs to be tested and make sure it's spill-proof? And that probably happens in the manufacturing facility, right? Before it even gets to our job, before it even gets to an interior designer for them to decide what type of carpet to come in. So we have those types of inspectors and testing. And then we have the inspectors and testing that happen in the field, on the project, at all times. Uh, a great example is that a few weeks ago, I was pouring concrete on elevated slabs for a hospital. And so down at the pump truck, we have a testing agency, and they come in and take samples of that concrete. They're measuring different things of slump, like how far it sinks or rises, and that determines our mixture. They'll take core samples of our elevated slab and break that core to see how much pressure that concrete can withstand. So see what I mean? We're opening up all these different possibilities in the built environment. It takes so many different types of people to build a building. And again, 
if we're building elevated slabs and we have cranes going around the job site, we need someone out there looking out for all of us, right? Safety is a big thing in construction. And safety is becoming even better with technology, with drones and robots. Think, if you guys had a drone that flew across a job site and was able to recognize safety hazards on that job site and send notifications to that superintendent or that project manager, think of how much more beneficial and how many more incidents and accidents can be prevented. And I'm not trying to scare you when construction is very safe and we do our best every day to make sure that everyone goes home the exact same way they came in, right? And so there's just ways that we can make that more efficient and better and predict things that might happen, right? And again, just like any business, we have marketing and accounting and HR and, you know, benefits people. I mean, it takes everyone to create a business. IT support, use them every day, right? So these next couple of slides, I just want to basically highlight and kind of show some inspiration of what I've done. And, you know, what did School of Architecture look like? What does a Master's of Science look like? And, and how I applied that to my education and my career afterwards. And so you guys can feel free to raise your hand, ask any questions as we go along. So let's start with architecture. I'm gonna, just going to highlight a couple of my favorite projects from architecture school. This one's great and interesting, and I love it. It's one of my favorite architecture projects. It's called the Museum of Fishing, and it's after the Gullah Geechee people. Gullah Geechee people are in North Carolina. And honestly, you guys, I struggled trying to find a project that year. I couldn't get passionate about something. I struggled. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with a great design. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I know that you guys can probably reach that same point in the East, right? Sometimes you get a roadblock or a mental block and you just don't know what you're going to do and something that you're passionate and happy and you want to pursue it. And so what I did is I dove into the Gullah Geechee culture and I started making a fishnet because they're really big on making their own fishnets and casting nets. So I started making my own. And through it, I got inspiration through the shadows of my cast net and how it created and I was like, that's it. I want to highlight the fishing methods of these people. And so then I created this museum of fishing. So I'm just going to go through some more photos here. So let me know if you guys want anything. Um, but again, so the design of this uh, museum was really for the fishnet. And so if you can see the way the shadows are cast, really resemble exactly the way that cast net is made and the shadows that it casts as well on the ground while it's moving through the air or even just on the wall. And within this museum, there's different, oh, we have a question? Okay, let's, let's, let's stop and let's pause. We have a couple of questions that came through. Great. Um, so one of them is, how long does it usually take for these, I think there's two questions, how long does it usually take for a construction project, or how long does it usually take for a degree in construction? They came in right around the same time, so I think if you answer both of those, that would be good. Okay, perfect. So let's start with a the degree. There's two ways you could do a degree in construction. I chose a graduate degree that's normally about two years. And it also depends if you're able to get your prerequisites done uh, and get that thesis approved. And so I had a thesis and I had to present that. And so uh, I was able to accomplish that in two years. There's another way that you can get a construction management degree and there is a four year program for that. And so that's another way that you can do it. So that'd be your undergraduate degree, a bachelor's. And after that four year degree, you can absolutely just go straight into that field. I chose to go the graduate route and get that master's of construction management to supplement my architectural degree to make sure that I was well-rounded and more prepared for going into the field and this career. And then the second question was about how long a project lasts? I think it is how long do, does a typical construction project last? How long does it take to, from start to finish? So it depends. We can make miracles happen with a lot of hard work and people work around the clock, 24 seven, seven days a week. Uh, but it really depends on the structure. 
You know, so if I have a hospital that has 100 patient beds and MRIs and surgical suites that needs to be built, some of it will depend on the lead time of that equipment. Say that MRI takes 24 months in order to be built and shipped to the project. And so right then and there, we have a timeline, right? Oh, yes. Uh, so, and then in other instances, we have buildings that, say, are testing a rocket. And so, in that sense, we have to have a 100-ton crane that will lift up that rocket into this building, and the whole building is used as a testing mechanism. But miracles can happen, and so, like, a building like that was built in just about a year and a half. But think about the amount of structural steel it required to build that building, right? And so, it really depends on your project. I, we've also done a full-on remodel an entire museum underneath an existing building in 30 days. State-of-the-art, beautiful museum, completely finished, lighting and all, in 30 days. And so it depends. Yeah. That's great. So what type of software do you use, or, or hardware? What type of technology do you use in your profession? That's an awesome question. Uh, so nowadays for architecture, I know that Revit and the BIM products of Autodesk are greatly utilized, and it also depends uh, depending on how advanced your engineers are and up to date they are on technology and software. Uh, but from the architecture side, that's a really great program. But there's other programs such as Rhino and SketchUp and let's see here. Photoshop and you know different video making programs and 3D interactive model building programs that allow us to communicate to the client in a three-dimensional way what their space is going to look like before we build it, right? So that's kind of more of the architecture engineering side. For my purpose in construction management, we have applications like PlanGrid and Procore and uh, well, let's see here, uh, it's now Autodesk Build that we use in the field on my iPad, and I can look at my 3D model right there on my iPad, and I can look at my plans right there on my iPad. I can go back through those sheets of drawings and see what changed. I can take measurements on there. I can take photos and videos. They even have glasses nowadays that you can put on, and you can visualize that whole model in the space as you're looking at it. So if I had on these glasses, I could see up above the ceiling and see all the systems and how they should be going and how they should be running. A large component in construction nowadays is VDC and BIM, um, so no, it's clash detection. And so if you think you have all these different engineers, the mechanical, the structural, the plumbing, there's a clash detection method that we can incorporate all their drawings in and make sure that our pipes and our duct are not running through our beams, right? So we have a variety of software and technology that we use. I mentioned drones and robots. 3D laser scanning is a big one as well for existing facilities, and that will allow us to draw points from it and actually build a 3D model without taking our traditional tape measure and laying out and drawing out the whole building. So, and there's kids like you and people like me that are thinking ahead of time and always making new things. And so I encourage and promote that. Just like in East, when you see a need in your, pro in your community, Take that and apply it to your career as well. You know, if you have a problem and you have an idea of how it should be solved, pursue that and get it out there. So hopefully that answers. Yeah. Um, you talked about uh, the drones that could like do safety measures. Are those in use right now? Yes, they are in use right now. And so for that example, if, if we have a drone above our construction site and it notices that we have a worker not wearing a hard hat, you know, it's something as simple as that to as large as we have a drone flying around and able to take uh, scaled measurements compared to other set dimensions and notice that this guardrail is not at the 42 inches and it's actually at 36 and so we need it to raise up in order to be safe, right? Any more questions online or anything? We have more coming through, but if you want to keep going on okay, your presentation, I'll, I'll, and then I'll, I'll keep I'll rolling pipe a little bit. Uh, so again, you know, Gula Gichi, So this is just more so design. These are actual photographs of models that I built by hand. 
You know, this was not a 3D project, but if you notice the shadowing and the way that this model was built, and I wish I had it in front of me, this model is this big, just that big, right? No idea. They can get from that big to about this big. It just depends on the scale. And so a thing about my architecture program is that the first two years they teach you by hand everything. And so you really learn how to work and think through your hands whether it's drawing or model building. And you get graded on all of this, your craftsmanship, your drawing, the amount of thought and thought through in your design. And it gets abstract. So this one's called door window stair, where we're exploring what the concepts are of a door, of a window. If there's an open window, is it also a door, right? And so in this sense, we were doing elephant sanctuaries, and that's why you see giant elephants sitting in the model. And again, models can come in all forms and directions. So the large one on the right is actually a plaster model, and it weighs about 15 pounds. That wasn't glued together at all. It's completely built together, built. I built it through interactions and cloth. Yeah. Yeah, so we have wood. And we have plaster, and so plaster is kind of like a, it re resembles a cementitious mixture. And so it's kind of resembling the concrete. So that plaster piece weighs 15 pounds, and it's held up by that single post, and then the stabilized on the back. No glue whatsoever, completely built just by wood and plaster. This piece down here at the bottom, paper thin. You see the hole in there? Paper thin. You can hold it up to the light and see through it. So these are the types of things that you would get to do and learn in architecture school, right? Yeah. So you said that the walls are covered with concrete, right? Yes. How would you get the concrete to stand up? So great question. How do we get this design into a reality, right? And so if we think back to it takes engineers to figure out how this makes, and there's temporary structures called formwork that we put in place, and then we would pump the concrete down into the wall. And I've actually got some more photos of actual projects where I can show you examples of that. So I'm going to go ahead and skip through here a little bit. Um, I think we're going to go uh, into urban landscape. This is in Manhattan, New York. This is an example of 3D modeling and the availability of that. So you can see all the different shadowing and the complex of design here. So you can accomplish that with your own hands, and you can accomplish that with technology as well. And they will teach you both in architecture school. So I'll just slide through here real quick to kind of show you some of those examples. Okay, let's kind of get into the more of the construction stuff. I think this is more fun in my opinion. <laughs> so unfortunately, I do not have any cool photos of that rocket manufacturing facility as it was being built. It is under national regulations because a rocket can be considered as a missile. Um, but I do have this one photo of me standing in the front of the facility. But I want to keep on going and go into uh, the hospital, actually. So I've got a lot of construction photos through here. This was taken just a few weeks ago, large hospital project. And you can see that I'm standing in one area that is built and in one area that is under construction. And if anyone has any questions about any of this, just it's okay. We can just keep on going and, and stop as we need to. My job involves all kinds of things. So even though I'm a project manager, I've been in more of hybrid roles in the past. And so I've been a superintendent. I have been a project manager. I have been a field engineer. I've been a quality manager. And I've been a scheduler. And so in this instance, you see me as superintendent in quality field, right? And I am approximately 80 feet in the air right there on a boom lift. You can't be scared in this project, but it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm going to show you kind of the process. And so you can see an elevation of our building, and this is scaffolding running all the way through. So like, how do we access these areas? Sometimes it's by a boom lift, like you just saw in the previous picture. Sometimes it's through scaffolding. And I'll show you some more going forward. You know, before we get to a finished, pretty looking product, there's a lot of systems that get built upon. So any idea what all the yellow on this building is? What the, what's the yellow on it? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. 
We do have some gypsum in there. Yes. Bingo. Can you say that louder? Moisture barrier. All that yellow is a moisture barrier. It's on top of that drywall. And it goes underneath our finished product. And so that's a moisture barrier. So people don't think that there's a ton of different processes and layers in order to create a building. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that last little portion there on the right side. I'm about to show you a photo now that's a little bit more finished product looking. Boom. So this is our finishes on the building. So what was yellow, now we have that finish, that paint, that stucco, that insulation on top of it. We have windows in. Yeah, go ahead. This project started in 2020, beginning of 2020, and the main part of the hospital ended approximately just last August. And then if you think back to that first photo where I'm standing in the part that's unfinished, that's ongoing right now. And that will end up in uh, July. So to that point, the hospital, we are dealing with a lot of logistics, right? We have a full-on 24-7 hospital that has its needs. And so in some ways, we have to work with the owner to make sure that we're not disrupting those operations. And so for this instance, that last piece of this building had to get built after the new entrance was open. And then we switched over and was able to build this next part. Great question. Yeah. I have not built anything up there yet. I, so just last week, and if you guys remember back to this morning, I, I actually moved back to my hometown area, and I'm a senior project manager now for Big Cedar Lodge, Best Pro Shops. And so we are building a lot of incredible things up there, and in Arkansas, and in Florida. And so we're kind of all over the place in the southeast, so it's coming. It's definitely coming. So we have some more questions that are coming through. Great. Um, what was the most important? What is the most important part of a building project? And then, are there? Have you ever made a mistake in your job that you had to overcome? Yes. Okay. Great questions. Hard questions. I would say the most important part of a construction project is communication. And I think that gets applied to a lot of careers. But communication in the documents, if my drawings don't have all the information I need it to have in order to build that, there's a problem. And that's a form of communication. If I'm not communicating clearly to all of the different trades, and those trades are not communicating to each other of where they're working, when they're working, what type of uh, making sure that we have openings to account for things passing through. That's another form of communication. Communicating large safety things. What happens if a hurricane comes, right? What happens if a tornado comes? You have to be able to communicate those emergency plans and get everyone on the same page and everyone nailing down that job site so that we don't have a huge impact from those storms. And so I would say communication is probably the biggest thing to accomplish a construction project. And then the next question was if I've made a mistake. I make mistakes all the time. And those mistakes might cost money. Those mistakes might not cost money. Those mistakes might say, I'm bad, my bad, I apologize. I need your help now because I wasn't right. How can I do this better? How can we do this better? I, let's see if I can give an example of a mistake I made. Uh, it was actually in a detail that I was helping and assisting with because we didn't have all the information. And so I was assisting with this detail. And I thought I had these materials landing right and overlapping correctly. And we go to test that curtain wall system and that interface to the slab on grade. And guess what? We failed. We failed. And so I raised my hand. I was like, that didn't work. I'm sorry, guys. How can we make it work? What's this material? You, you know, the glass glazing guys, you have this material. Waterproofing, you have this one. What are the properties? How can we test it before we put it in to make sure it's going to work? Right? Now, unfortunately, that test that we failed cost me money, right? But at the same time, you have to go through your career with confidence. You can't be afraid of messing up. 
You can't be made, afraid of making mistakes. It's going to happen. But that's when you surround yourself by the people that know what to do, how to do it, people with better expertise, knowing people to call, right? Awesome. OK, so I wanted to let you guys know, who thinks that I just left my architecture degree in the dust? I don't use it ever. OK, good, no one. I use my architecture degree all the time. And so here's an example of I had a situation in the field, and my subcontractors were needing help on how to design it. And so this is another way where I'm using technology, quick things in the field, got my iPad, take a picture, using Autodesk Sketchbook in order to make this design. I've got dimensions on there. I've got a three-dimensional drawing that I can build off. It goes from that basic to this complex. How am I going to design this gutter system? My drawings didn't have clear direction. How can I make this better and more buildable, right? Buildable to where I have the room in order to get that drill in there. Buildable to have a man or a woman up on that roof installing that drain. How can I make a better system in order to be fire safe and fireproofed? So going into as complex as this, presenting this to the architect that knows that building code better than I do, that knows that fire safety better than I do, say, hey, will this work? And going with it, right? OK, earlier I said we had a lot of Harry Potter fans, right? So this is a beautiful ride. It's got a great finished product. What did it take to get to that? A lot. How many cranes did it take to get to that? Just an idea. 10? Any idea? 12? <laughs> what about type of cranes? Does anyone know that we have different types of cranes? We've got tower cranes. We've got smaller cranes that are just right there on a truck that you can roll in. Tower cranes have to be built and dismantled when that hurricane's coming. On this project, we had three tower cranes. Three tower cranes in order to reach this radius of where this roller coaster was going. And then every once in a while, we had to bring in other cranes in just in order to set certain equipment and get into tighter spaces, right? So if you can imagine that beautiful end product of a roller coaster ride, it took hundreds of people to build. This project got completed in a year. So going through and getting some. So you asked about concrete earlier, right, and how that form works. You can see in here some different foundations, circular tubes that go up, and that's the foundation of that roller coaster. So they can go in forms of that to as walls, to different forms of stepping down. They can even be curved. There's a lot that you can do with concrete. About the type of equipment that we use. That bucket on that machine can take three of me, and I can stand inside it. That's how massive in the type of things. How do you guys know or think a, let's see, hopefully this video will work. There we go. Piece of the roller coaster going in and getting bolted in. One of the tower cranes has this, and it's completely strapped down. Do you think an engineer had to engineer how that piece of roller coaster track was going to be angled correctly, held up by that crane, and then maneuvered in place in order to make that bolting connections in those welds? Absolutely, right? That's why it takes all kinds of kinds. Even on this roller coaster project, I got to utilize my degree. And so you can see underneath this track and where those brakes are, there's a whole bunch of framing system. In order to power those brakes and those tracks, there's disconnects and transformers. How did that get attached to the roller coaster? Well, I helped design that. We had no idea. Engineer didn't want to provide that information, so we came together and I helped design that. Here's a prime example for you of that concrete. You can see steel here in the front work, and so those steel cages, and that's the reinforcement that goes in your concrete to make sure it's not going to crack, to make sure it's going to stay structurally sound throughout the ride. And so all of that gets formed up in very different ways, and it takes an engineer to design that. And don't forget that we have those civil engineers and everything happens underground too, right? OK, we're reaching an open discussion. So any more questions that we have? I think we just have a couple more minutes left. Yeah, go ahead. What's the longest project that you've ever done and how long did it take? 
longest project. My personal longest project was probably just about two years. So all of these projects that you saw this morning and just now, I've been able to accomplish and be a part of those in just five years. Yes? Right, uh, so I'm not the actual designer on some of these projects. And so those inspiration, those people that do design it, it'll come from the books, it'll come from the movies. And so it kind of really depends on the owner. And you know, if there's a design, or maybe sometimes the design is dictated by the uh, function of the space, right? And so then it doesn't get as much creative and it's a little more. Or maybe your uh, inspiration is an artifact and you design everything around an artifact. Just like in architecture school, my inspiration was a group and a people, a culture. And so that can happen. Now, in my day-to-day -day inspiration, it's working with all the people that I get to work with and seeing them build things with their hands. So I think we, yeah, go ahead in the back. All right. So I got two questions. Yes. Um, the first one is how long, like, for schooling do you need for, for an engineer? How long for school for an engineer? Yeah. For like in so it will depend on the field that you go to and your school that you go to. Typically, that's about four years. And sometimes in order to break up those harder classes, it will span over five years. And then you can continue your education into graduate and PhDs as well. Okay. And then my second question is, have you been on the roller coaster? <laughs> I have not. I have not ridden the roller coaster. Uh, I'm going to go with him real quick. The work you're doing with B Big Cedar Lodge, are you guys now, is Big Cedar an owner of the projects and the company that you're working for, you guys are pretty much like a, almost a real estate company? In Great your question. So in my previous experience, I've been more of a general contractor side and I work with the subcontractors underneath me and managing them. And with Big Cedar Lodge, that's more considered the owner side. So I'm an owner's representative. The types of projects we do at Big Cedar Lodge, though, can range from more traditional, where now I will hire a general contractor to manage the subcontractors and build out. And then I'd be in more direct or conversations with the architects and engineers and that contractor. But there's also some smaller projects that we go ahead and just handle ourselves. And so in that way, we're a little bit of a hybrid and we're still managing just like we would a general contractor as well. Yeah. Yeah, so an uh, example of where we would be managing ourselves would be the Cathedral of Nature that you guys saw at the very end of my presentation this morning. That's something that's been completely managed by us. And, you guys are the owner. and we are the owner, yes. And then another example, say I was building a brand new lodge. I could do all of the uh, earthwork getting up to it, kind of the conceptual things. I'm really heavy on the design phase and making sure that all of our departments of food and beverage and logistics are, are being able to get input on that design and then hiring a general contractor to come in and build it while I manage that general contractor. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One. What's the most complicated project you've had? And two, how hands-on are you? And hand with, how hands-on are you with the projects? Uh, so hands-on all the way. All hands-on to the point of I'm applying material, right? And, and so that it can be as hands-on as that, and I'm in the lift itself and doing things, uh, or hands-off to where I'm in an office sitting in front of a computer. But it's really interactive. Um, and the first question was the most complicated project. Let's see here. The most complicated project, I would probably say, you know, they're all complicated. I mean, honestly, they're all complicated. Hospitals have different systems, such as your medical gas going through them. And then rocket manufacturing, they have special uh, electrical requirements and water requirements and structure in order to account for the weight of a rocket, right? And then we have a roller coaster that has tons of moving dynamics and different brakes and, um, and ways to make it go fast, right? And then think about the energy that that pulls in order to run a roller coaster, right? We're talking wires that big for miles. Yeah, the landscaping, everything gets so complicated. Um, and then, you know, even recently, the Cathedral of Nature. Sometimes that rock's unstable, 
and then sometimes we're just exploring and so we've got to bring in engineers to make sure that that rock is staying stable and so it's even got its own complexity to it right and the scale of that massiveness right you can't even imagine how big that is and we're still exploring it right great questions any other questions we have some online I don't think we have time but I would love to if we do we are all out of time okay well, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to be walking around and hopefully get to meet everyone in, in the conference in the exhibit hall. So thank you, guys.